Thank you for joining us for the Redeeming Truth podcast today. I'm John. I'm one of the pastors here at Redeemer, and we have a special guest today. This is Michael O'Fallon. Uh, he is the, the the president of Sovereign Nations, uh, a ministry that uh, that has doing some incredible work. That if you're not familiar with new discourses, if you're not familiar with the causes of things, if you're not familiar with the other podcasts and material that that he puts out with others, you really need to know about it. You really need to get involved with it. All the people that I've shared it with become binge listeners of this stuff, and they tell me I've I listened to I listened to sixty different podcasts in the past week. It's I can't get enough of it. And so we are really blessed to have him here. And and so for me, I'm, I'm one of those people. I binge listen to dozens of hours, hundreds of hours of these things and trying to understand the world the way it is. Because if you're like me, you're you're looking out at the world going, things have changed. They've changed incredibly rapidly. What in the world is going on? How do I even process this? I'm not even, I feel like I'm 10 steps back from where, where the change is happening. And how did we even get here? And what in the world is going on? Well, I don't know anybody better to explain that than, than Michael. And so I, we're, we're incredibly blessed to have you here. And so just kind of along those lines, as somebody who has listened to all of those things, um, that's great for someone like me, but for someone who hasn't listened to anything, on these issues, how would you help them understand what is it that's going on in our world right now? I think the best way to understand it is that we're going from a physical, objective, tangible world, um, really an analog world, into a digital, subjective, Mm -hmm. surreal world. We're moving from a world where things are real, where you can touch things, where you can see things, where you can you can basically falsify and go through the scientific method to find out whether something's true or false. And where you're moving to is you're moving to a world where, no, it's not a question of what is true or false that's important. What's important is operational success in terms of what we want to accomplish. Mm -hmm. Now, when we go that far and say, well, you know, that there's something that someone wants to accomplish, naturally people go to say, well, you sound like a conspiracy theorist. And the thing that most people, I think, have a hard time understanding is that the majority of people like you, me, and everybody else, we live our lives day to day, right? Mm -hmm. We, we, We do our jobs. We go to work. Pastors, they prepare the message. They shepherd the flock in the world, but not of it, right? Mm -hmm. And we depend upon the sovereignty and providence of God. We, uh, we feed upon the word and we live life according to the scriptures in a way that we trust that things around us are going to be somewhat normative, right? Mm -hmm. And for most of our lives, that's the way that we could say that we grew up. But instead, there are people, especially people that are very, very successful, that they measure things and want to accomplish certain things in their lives. So yes, they design certain things to be able to get the objectives that they actually want Mm -hmm. to attain. So in many ways, you could say that, unfortunately, we're really at the end of around a hundred year long shaft of a spear at this point. Mm. And where you could see that many that had goals to be able to transition our world into something that is far less than what the, and at least from our Western civilizational standpoint would be the American ideal or necessarily the ideal of those that have grown up in Great Britain or other places or within a Judeo-Christian perspective, they have goals instead of really trying to reach some of those goals that would have been the goals of folks like Marx and Hegel and so forth, Mm. where the state becomes really the God, if you will. The state becomes the heaven, Mm. where instead of us really reaching out to um, an eschatological fulfillment, that is us living our lives, being godly, living in a nation that respects our liberties and our freedoms, is that instead they're moving towards more of a let's make sure that we accomplish the things that Marx and others and so forth really uh, saw as valuable. And Mm -hmm. I think one way of of looking at this is that people that are necessarily technocratic in their way of looking at things, that means that they want to be specialists. They they want to make sure that they are the scientists Mm -hmm. that design our world, is that they always have utopias to some extent. They believe that there's a way that the world should be that if it was according to you and I in, in terms of the way that we would vote, mm-hmm. we don't know what's best for us. John Benzinger and Michael mm-hmm. Fallon, they just don't know. Mm-hmm. We know what's best for them and as well collectively for the rest of society. Right. So, of course, their utopia 
in whatever the way that they actually imagine it to be, that is always according to the way that they have designed. And as well, they're always the ones who are in charge of it, not yeah, us. So, so unfortunately, that's the way things, they end up moving, especially you can see that happening in nations like China, where my wife is from. You can see that happening in other nations where, um, you know, Marxism and as well uh, a, a technocratic socialism has really taken hold. Uh, you can see that happening within the the fascistic governments and national socialism of the 1940s. That idea, there's an ideal that's there that everybody collectively has to to move towards, and so it's that whole idea that Rousseau and Rousseau would be really the precursor of the French Revolution would would basically say that, you know, everywhere man is enslaved and it is only his chains that he must lose in order to be freed from those things. And those are the, the concepts that were picked up by, by Marx, Hegel, and others. Mm. So as we move towards these things, what you see is within your world is all of a sudden things don't seem to make sense, do they? Right. You know, so when you hear, let's say, Pete Buttigieg, for example, say, he comes up to the microphone about three, four months ago, and he says, our goal as transportation secretary is to eliminate uh, deaths by car accidents by 2030. And everybody goes, well, that's a great thing, I think. I would want to do the same thing, make sure mm -hmm. that we get to zero car deaths. But what does he mean by that? Yeah. What he means is John Benzinger doesn't need to be in control of his automobile. Either does Mike O'Fallon or anybody else that's in the room with us here. Instead, we have a system that will be in charge of making sure that you arrive at the destination that you need to go to, and you're not going to be the one that actually has volitional control of your vehicle. That's what he means by what he's saying. But the way that he achieves that is by first saying something that's scary, that mm -hmm. makes you and I feel vulnerable. Yeah. Well, we all probably know someone who has passed away or has been very, very hurt yeah. or whatever in a car accident. And so what you want to do is say, look, there's a vulnerability here, but we have a solution to that. And the solution is you don't drive anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you don't have a car anymore that's your own car. Instead, we're going to put it in a system. So it's that kind of thing that you'll start to see across the board as we move especially from what would be a on-demand economy mm -hmm. where we're able to to say hey look i need this now i order it on amazon or i go to the store and i pick it up uh i'm hungry i want this for dinner tonight you know my wife and i are going to mm. have chicken or whatever but all of a sudden those things become scarce because we're going into what's called a sustainable model and what that means is we're going from an on-demand capitalistic system into a rationed socialistic system so that's in a in a nutshell that's where we're going as a whole with things and really coming away from the concept of national sovereignty hmm. so as we move away from this whole idea that we have a, a nation that is sovereign and as well within the united states you have people that are in essence yeah. individual sovereignty mm -hmm. right in that john benzinger or michael fallon can decide what they're going to do in their household and the government shall not infringe upon that absolutely so now we're moving into an infringement kind of scenario where, again, someone has designed a society that we need to transition into that knows better than you and I know. So the move is to get us all to a societal side of things where this idea of a republic and um, a democratic republic really isn't what's going to need to take place. Instead, you have what they would call our democracy, which is not a constitutional system in and of itself. Right. So as we start to move away from what we knew, so many people, I think, are caught into the, well, hopefully things are going to get better soon, right? Oh, well, this can't last for long. Right. Gasoline can't be $5 for gall uh, a gallon for long. You're right. It, it, it won't. It'll be $7 before, before long right. and $10 before long because, once again, you're trying to move everybody out of their previous system. So if right. Pete Buttigieg's, Buttigieg's words of, of, you know, we need to eliminate car deaths is not enough. Well, just eliminating your ability to afford to drive your car is another way of achieving that. Yeah. So we start moving in these directions and it ends up having an effect in everything else that we, we do in our lives. So, so as I'm, as, as people watching this are, are looking out at the world and they're seeing, okay, there's, there's tension that is brought into some system, whether it's mm. food, whether it's race, gender, 
um, there's there's tension that's brought in. But what you're saying is that the issue, the tension that's being brought is not the real issue in the sense that the issue is not fixing racism. The issue is not fixing uh, gender, gender discrimination. There's a, there's a higher goal to the, all of these things. Can you speak to that too? Yeah. I mean, if you, <clears throat> if you want to, um, destroy a civilization that has what you would call, this is what Gramsci would refer to it. And Gramsci was an Italian Marxist that took a different pathway than, um, necessarily the pathway that, that, Karl Marx would say yeah. is laid out before us. He would say that we need to look at a way of breaking what would be called the cultural hegemony. And so what you need to do is if you want to break the cultural hegemony that holds a society together, those pillars of foundation, what you want to do is create a counter hegemony. So something that goes against the things that we know to be true, where boys like girls and girls like boys boys mm -hmm. stay boys and girls stay girls mm -hmm. even to the point you know in the 60s and 70s the big feminist movements and so forth that they mm -hmm. were about women that's right well now you can't even say what a woman is right um or to even define what a woman is and that whole idea of getting to an objective truth is something that is frowned upon but wait before but the, the idea being that when it comes to why they don't define it, mm. it's not that they can't not define it. They, they can define it. They just have an operational goal beyond that, or they don't want to be attacked by those who have that operational goal, right? So, right, and so what they do is they create what's called the floating signifier. Mm -hmm. Because between the sign and the signifier, there's trace that helps us to be able to define what something is. This is a microphone stand. Right. Um, this is, table, this is yeah. a table and so forth. So between the sign and what the signifier is that allows us to be able to understand that, what they want to do is create a floating signifier. So mm -hmm. it, nothing is staying stable and right. nothing is what you call it and so forth. Well, because because conservatives will constantly point out, or not even conservatives, just rational people will point out the inconsistencies, but the inconsistencies don't matter. It's, right. it's, it's like it's like they don't even happen because you can have somebody that's like the first uh, black woman to be on the Supreme Court. And yet she can't even define what a woman is. And right. you're like, and so it, it almost plays to our sign signifier thing. It plays to our innate knowledge of things mm -hmm. on the one hand, while trying to disrupt it at the same time. Well, and think about that for a second. If we're talking about a position of someone who's going to be a Supreme Court judge, all of a sudden what seems to be important and what is something that must be historic and we must celebrate is that someone has immutable characteristics that for the first time is now becoming a federal judge or a mm -hmm. Supreme Court judge, where really what we should be worrying about is whether or not someone is going to be faithful to their interpretation of the Constitution as it was originally intended. Right. All of a sudden, that's not important anymore. Mm -mm. What's important is that it's going to be coming from a woman's perspective or an African-American woman's perspective or even a homosexual perspective or mm -hmm. a Latino perspective or whatever the mm -hmm. case may be as opposed to, well, it's not a question of perspective. It's a question of what the original intent of that is, mm -hmm. which would be the same <clears throat> issue once you, once you get into biblical interpretation as well. Right. So with constitutional interpretation, if all of a sudden that's not what's important anymore, it's like, what does it really say? And aren't we all in agreement with that? Because we're here to make sure that the Constitution is followed. And if this new law, if this new legislation actually passes constitutional muster, mm -hmm. well, if all of a sudden what the Constitution means is up to you and is up to your lived experience, well, you're going to get all sorts of weird judgments. Yeah, absolutely. So the idea is then coming into a system, creating a counter hegemony yes, against sir. the 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 received hegemony, the received power structures, the received just what what is normal for people, men or men, women or women, and all of that. So then, what's the next step after you create you you bring in the counter hegemony? Well, what you want to do is then everything that is cannot be anymore. So everything that you look at in terms of something that's stable within society, something that has a traditional background, something that everybody's accepted as, well, that's the way that that is. That's what well, that's a cat or that's a chair or whatever the case is. 
you want to come in and, and basically criticize that thing. You want to come in and point out or accelerate the contradictions. You want to find something to say, well, that's only that because the male patriarchal bigoted whatever says that it is. And that is the power structure that must be deconstructed. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to come in and is you're trying to deconstruct all the things that you know to be true. Mm-hmm. All the things that make society run the way it runs right now, because what you want to do is break it. Mm-hmm. So whether that be in the church, whether that be in society or in government, or just the way that men and women have been mm-hmm. relating to each other for eons, yeah. what you want to do is shatter that. You want to bring in yeah. other movements that come in and say, no, women, you can't talk to men because men are this. Men, you have to be careful when you talk to women. And even the discussion or saying, hey, would you like to go to dinner? Well, that's considered assault or a micro assault or Mm -hmm. somehow impinging upon that person. Well, then what you do is you disrupt the ability for men and women to then create families. And all of a sudden, when you create a breakdown of the family and you reduce the birth rate, And then all of a sudden what you're doing is you're not even waiting for that. You're going to children and you're going children that are even ages five to 10 and saying, do you feel like a girl or do you feel like a boy? And tell me, what do you feel about this? Does that make you feel uncomfortable? We believe you need to transition. So you're getting them early as well and you're destroying their lives. You're destroying their their ability to propagate the species. You're destroying their ability to have family. Because the goal is that the state will be your family and the family will be the state. Right. And so if that's the goal and the way that you reach that mm-hmm. is by making sure that no one can have family in the future, yeah. that, that no one can produce their own children and have autonomy over their family in terms of the way that our government is set up. Mm-hmm. Well, now you start to have success. So you break apart everything in your culture. You basically come in and you throw acid on everything that you can that is currently a pillar of civilization. Education. You demolish education. You bring in subjectivism into education. You you come in and you take a look at major league sports. And every major league sport, everything that they're about right now is about social justice. You come into the church, and this is the most tragic part of it all. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you take what was a gospel. That is for sinners to be saved by the grace of God, repenting of their sins, giving their lives to Christ, and having that infusionary aspect of Christ come and dwell within them Mm -hmm. and them to be saved. Instead, you make that gospel about justice. Mm -hmm. You make it a gospel of vengeance. You make it a gospel of basically resentment. Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden it's about fixing things in society Mm-hmm. as opposed to you dying to self and becoming alive in Christ, mm-hmm. by Christ. That's the problem. And when we've seen that movie already in 100 years ago, in the split between the fundamentalists and the modernists, we, we saw mm-hmm. that already. Um, and that created a new, created evangelicalism is what came out of that. Mm-hmm. Fundamentalism became just kind of irrelevant modernism became the mainline denominations evangelicalism comes out of the ashes unfortunately what i'm seeing now is that evangelicalism is adopting the kind of depraved cult mind of the of first uh, of romans chapter one to where all of that relational tension that that romans one Mm. says is going to be the result of god leaving the culture for the third time the depraved mind Mm. the result is that now we we just we're fighting against each other cancel culture has come into the church now to where we're not adopting Romans 12, 10, outdo one another in honor and these kinds of things, love one another as I have loved you, like Jesus says, that's out the window because cancel cancel culture is more dominating our discourse now versus what we're told to do. But so that's one thing. But I also know that those who are trying to deconstruct Christianity know this about us that we are supposed to be forgiving we're supposed to believe the best Mm. and they use that against us yeah and would you say that um as far as ecclesiology goes where would you say that that you feel it attacking the church the most you know in in regards to how it actually is breaking when you when you when you say that there are things that were just obviously true right that now are being questioned like what's false uh, like there's one race, the human race, mm. 
like there is um, that, like you said, the gospel is about sin and salvation. That that it is not about justice in the mm-hmm. sense like it's it's not getting justice. It's getting mercy. That's the gospel, mm. and that yes, there are outworkings of the gospel that play out in our daily lives. But mm. that's different than saying the gospel is this thing. No, the gospel is what Jesus did on the cross in his resurrection. That's the good news. The response to the good news is is repent and believe and you'll be saved from going to hell. So so when I think about love is redefined. I mean, everything is being redefined within evangelicalism now. And then what happens is that the people who hold to the to the legacy who who hold to what, what like no this is what it says this is what this word means in the original languages this is sound theology well you're toxic you're the right. you're the bad guy and right. so so they create this like no like we're we're the good guys and if you believe that you're a bad guy right so that we can create this new thing I, i'm seeing it not just in evangelicalism i'm seeing it with disney Disney takes Disney takes <laughs> yeah. legacy characters from thing. all of their different things, totally deconstructs these legacy characters, right. and then when the fan base goes, "Hey, why did you do that?" Well, you're a toxic fan base because you can't accept the new thing that's going on. It's like right. what's happening at Di- I'm, I'm watching this with Disney characters, like Star Wars characters, oh. and I'm going, "Wait a minute, this is happening. Oh, yeah. This is happening in evangelicalism." Well, that was the whole point. Sorry to get off on on Star Wars, but that was the whole point of three episodes that basically yeah. is retelling the uh, episodes four, four, five, and six, and then seven, eight, and nine are basically going back and deconstructing four, five, and exactly. six, yes, and replacing Luke now with the new, uh, you know, character that is female, with basically making everything about the patriarchy, making everything about demolishing what was the systemic structure. But the same thing, then you're right. It happens in the church and the way that it attacks the church. And unfortunately, so so many people are unaware of these things. And sadly, they also trust a lot of their leaders implicitly um, to the point where they are willing to, to, to trust a leader to the point where the leader starts taking them down the road of Marxism. And they just, because of cogniz- cognitive dissonance, they just can't believe that so-and-so would take us there. Right. That all of a sudden we're bringing in these concepts, we're bringing in identity Marxism. And even though there were some of us five, six years ago, that were screaming at the top of our lungs going, do you not see what they're doing to you? And people yes. said, well, but it's so-and-so and he wouldn't do that. And right. It's like, oh no, yes, he would. And that's what's happening. And so unfortunately, people I think are right now in a very uncomfortable state, which is again, a vulnerable position, right? Mm-hmm. Is that people I think are at a point where it's like, well, who do I trust? Right. And in many ways, this is the same kind of groundwork that existed in the pre-Reformation time, if you take a look at what happened in Avignon, France. Hmm. And so in Avignon, France, you had another pro- pope that then was was crowned, and then that pope decided that he was going to take up his papal residence in Avignon, France, as opposed to back at the Vatican. And then all of a sudden, what you ended up having was these competing popes then, one at the Vatican and one in Avignon and so forth. And the people around going, well, hold on a second. If you're my sole authority in matters of faith, and now there's two claimants to this throne, well, which one is true? Is this all just a bunch of baloney? Right. And so that's really where I think you saw things begin. I think it's one of the reasons why the French Huguenots were so strong and really took off at the time that Luther, Calvin, and others that had sacrificed so much, why they were able to really spread the gospel of the Reformation throughout France, especially southern France, southwest France, mm-hmm. and southeast France. Um, but I think that that's really one of the things that's happening again now is people are going, well, hold on, what's my authority here? My mm-hmm. authority is the scripture. Now, you're telling me that I have to read the scriptures differently, which is what you were just saying, right. which again now you're throwing in a thousand floating signifiers. All right. of a sudden, complementarianism doesn't mean complementarianism no, anymore. Doesn't. All of a sudden... Um, there are we have to listen to new perspective and new voices and so forth and those of us that have been the traditional voices in regards to the hierarchy that's biblical well we have to stay quiet and listen Mm -hmm. which is the same game that's going on everywhere else yes it is whether you say disney whether it be in the fields of education Mm -hmm. whether you be in mathematics where they're telling you that two plus two must equal five and so that's your lived experience then yeah well, what is four and what is plus and what is two? 
And yeah. so if all those things are called into question all of a sudden, and we really, I, I think the phrase that you, you hear that's like, there it is, is, you know, everything that you heard before was wrong. You know, yes. <laughs> you know whatever, whatever it is, whether it be in an email ad or whatever it is, yeah. it's like, oh, here it comes. Here we go again. And it's the same thing that they start bringing to you and saying that you must take this and this is the thing that you must accept now, even though it violates everything that you knew before. And that's where you should go, wait, stop. No, no, no. We're not going that fast. You know, let's take our time. All of a sudden in Christianity, you had between the years of about 2012 and 2018, you had hundreds and hundreds of books that are almost becoming like a new canon. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you had books by Jamar Tisby, you had books by Eric Mason, and then all of a sudden, those that are you being used on the outside, like at Coca-Cola and Disney and other places where they're getting this stuff, mm -hmm. like White Fragility, yeah. all of a sudden, that's being introduced in pulpits of Southern Baptist churches yeah. and PCA churches. So there is a cross-pollination, a cross-parasitic move that's happening. where And that's what this is. This idea, mm -hmm. the ideology comes along, and it's like a parasite. Yeah. It's vampire-like. It comes in, and it bites the host. It yeah. latches itself onto the host. It kills the host. And the host comes back as something different. Yeah. And in essence, that's what you, I think, have happening right now within the church. And you have, you have Marx saying that the things that will hold back the revolution are mm. fan, our faith and the family. And so for those, so, so for people who know communism or who know these ideologies, you see these attacks and you go, well, duh, of course they're coming after the church. And of course they're coming after the family. But, but now, so, so as, as people are watching things going on in the world and they're going, what's with all the groomer schools? What's like, mm. what, what is all of this going on? Mm -hmm. This is part of the agenda. This is, this is coordinated. In other words, this is, there is a playbook for all of this, right? Yeah, well, and there is. And I, I think that you can take a look. Yes, Marx. Yes, Hegel, as you are basically accelerating the, the contradictions, you're, you're basically moving the diet, the spiraling of the dialectic towards where you end up with the utopian state, but also Gramsci, I think also yeah. when you take a look at what happened with Marcusa, and then as well, kind of blending this with postmodernism. So I don't want to use a very bad analogy, which is the one that we've been using lately, lately but it's the same uh, piece of dung mm -hmm. <laughs> that's now been put in the body of a shiny brand new 787 Boeing yeah. that just came off the assembly line. So it's the same Marxist Hegelian piece of dung put in this yeah. shiny new package and then flown to you because the marketing has been done better. But what you really have, and maybe this is something that our audience can relate to, is that you have ideological gain of function. Mm -hmm. So you've taken a virus and you've found ways of making it worse and worse and mm -hmm. worse. So you start off with Rousseau, you move to Hegel and Kant, you move to Marx, you then move to the Fabians and to, to Gramsci, and then you move through the, through the critical school of Horkheimer and Lukács and all the other guys mm -hmm. and Adorno, and you go through Marcusa, who was really awful. Uh, and then you go into the postmodernists and you start mm -hmm. to shape this thing in a way that can serve a purpose outside of just a class consciousness which right. is what Marx would bring. All of a sudden, it's now an identi identity right. consciousness, is that it's not a question of our class being below where the bourgeoisie is. Now, everything is the bourgeoisie com compared to, to us. Means, right. 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 So so let me go, going back to the church, you're in a unique position because you know why this is happening. And so can you kind of, because somebody watching this right now could say, okay, there's the why aspect from the culture, the, the socialists, but that's not us. We're evangelicals. We yeah. stood against this stuff. We always stood against this stuff. We, we, were the, we were the bulwark against this stuff. And now the enemy's in the camp. Like, how did this happen? Why in the world is this happening with us? We usually pushed all this away, but we did, we're not this time. Why is that happening? Well, I think a couple of things, and just to be as blunt as possible, um, enormous amounts of money and promises of power and safety in the future. Hmm. When all of a sudden... Even, and you're not just saying that, you know that. I, I participated in it. Hmm. So I know. Um, but there's a sense of safety when, when someone comes to you and says, look, there's a change that's going to be coming and there's nothing you can do to stop this change. 
It's going to happen. So either you can be on this side with us and you'll have benefits and we'll make sure that you're taken care of. But if you're on this side, things aren't going to be good for you at all. Mm. So it's carrot or stick basically that's given. And I had that same speech given to me. I I can't tell you how many times I, I said six times the other day, somewhere between four to six times. I know I heard it several times within the church, but I first heard it in the corporate world. Mm. And because I'm involved in a lot of different travel companies and organizations, Mm -hmm. I heard it in the political world. I heard it from someone that was involved with um, a think tank as well. Mm -hmm. So many different people that thought, okay, here's a guy that we should talk to and say, Mm -hmm. all right, you can help us here. By the last two times that I heard it, I said, let me finish your sentence for you. And I'm not going to do that. And you probably shouldn't have said that to me. But basically the idea was, was that, Something is going to happen that will change everything. There's going to be all sorts of pain that's felt. Now, you can be protected through this pain if you're with us on this side. And this goes, the first time that I heard this was back in 2009. And after I heard it the first time in 2009, uh, the second time that I heard it was right after the Southern Baptist Convention mm-hmm. at a dinner that I was having having with Southern Baptist leaders. So I was like, okay, I just heard this from a Chinese billionaire tycoon. And now you're saying this to me. Hmm. I know where this is coming from. Somehow you're saying the same thing. So the the idea that there is a change of really what you could call it is a meta system change that's coming, where we've it's had a worldwide massive everything is going to change. Yeah, idea. everything that yeah. you know to be true must be changed. Our financial system must change. Our ways of knowing must be changed. Our way of governance must be changed. Our way of communication must be changed. And as a matter of fact, you need to be changed. You yourself, not just the systems, it's you. And so this change that's coming, or that is actually already, we're in the midst of it right now. uh, The only way that we can really overcome this is by every human being basically saying no. I'm not calling for bloody revolutions or anything else. That's not, I don't think that that's something that's necessary. But I think it's just standing up and saying no and basically calling them out for what this stuff is. And so when, John, when when this came to me at those times, yeah, I still hesitated because you just think that the things that you're hearing and you're sitting in meetings, there's no way that they're going to really try to do this because you've heard other pie in the sky ideas before. But then all of a sudden, when you start to see more and more heads of state start to show up to some of those meetings and really powerful people. And then all of a sudden, everybody's having two or three day long conferences talking about the details of how this can happen and so forth. You start going, okay, this is real. They're really going to do this. And so the church had to change in their eyes because the way that they looked at the church or any faith, whether it be Roman Catholicism, evangelical Protestantism, it doesn't matter, is that the church in essence is like another form of media. So just like, of course, how they've come into our mainstream media and they've come in and said, okay, here's the narrative. This is what can be said and this is what can't be said. And this is where we all have to move things along. They're coming into the church where you have, look, I don't know how many people come to your church on Mm -hmm. a, on a weekly basis, but 3000, how many, Mm -hmm. uh, 2000 people that come, you have a captive audience that comes into your church once a week for an hour and a half or two hours and writes down everything that you say. They sing the songs that have the messages that you want to have conveyed. If you can command that media source that's reaching tens of millions of people all over the United States, all over the world, and you can start to, again, change the message, deconstruct the message, but still have them writing the notes and singing the new songs. Hmm. Now you can really affect change Mm -hmm. because you have the media, you have faith and the churches, you have education, you have the pillars of culture, like what you just said of Disney. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You also have what else? You have major league sports. You have so business, you have everything. You have everyone saying the same thing. So so folks that are in the church should say, why is my pastor saying the same thing as MSNBC, saying the same thing as BlackRock, saying the same thing as the local university that's public over here that's lost their minds, why is everyone saying the same thing? Exactly. And so you have to pause for a second and go, okay, there's something happening here. 
Yes. And whatever it is, it's something that we really don't want to be a part of because no one came and had this discussion with, with the, the average person. No. They had no respect for them. Mm-mm. They just thought they could lie to them forever. Mm-hmm. So the average person has to say, let's stop with the lies. Let's stop with the manipulation. I know what you're trying to do to me. Let's get back to just talking about what it is that you want to do. No, right. that's not negotiable. We're not going to do that. And right. that's what they're afraid of. Absolutely. And, and when it comes to our form of government, you either have to convince 50.1% of the people to go along with your thing, or you have to put mechanisms in place to subvert all of that in one way or another, right? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, what you do is you set up a framework that, you know, a new framework of, of discipline, a new framework of, of penalty where, look, if we were to go back four or five years and if I was to say to you or somebody else, Hey, if you have a position on the country of Ukraine, that social media doesn't like all of your posts could get taken down. If you have a particular opinion on a on a health procedure that mm-hmm. social media doesn't like you to ta- to, mm-hmm. to have, they're going to take all of you down. If you don't have, if you have an opinion that is in opposition to the main media position on an election that maybe took place that social media doesn't like, you're possibly going to get taken down. So you have to start saying for a second, hold on a second, we're in a position basically that the reformers were in many ways, Hmm. but it's larger and societal to where, hold on a second, that's not the teaching of the church right there. Hmm. That's not within our catechism. That's not within the doctrines of what we teach. That's heresy and either recant, which is what they told Luther, Mm -hmm. either recant or there's going to be problems for you. There'll be a death sentence for you. Well, today it's not that there's going to be a death death sentence for us, but you basically experience digital death. Mm Mm-hmm. Because we're transitioning from an analog world into a digital world. We're, we're transitioning from real world experience, real life experiences into digital meta experiences instead. Right. That's part of the problem. So somebody watching this now might be, okay, I get it. I see what you're talking about. So what in the world can we do about this? And I personally, I, I, want, I want to hear your answer, but personally, I think that that solid, whether they're Christians or not, Judeo-Christian value, Judeo-Christian worldview, believing people have to put the idol of comfort to death. Yeah. Or that's or it's or nothing's going to happen. Like there there has to be a commitment to say I'm going to stand against this no matter what happens to me, because this is not this is not an in-house debate. This is something that has led to the death of, of tens of millions of people in the past. Yeah. There's no reason why it shouldn't happen again. Um, there, there's, no, there's no significant difference to what we're seeing now versus what we saw in the early 20th century, yeah. ideologically or practically. And, and on, on top of that, you have the evidence that it's exactly the same on our streets two years ago in the summer of 20. Mm-hmm. You saw it. You, you actually saw it with your own eyes if you were paying attention that this is a violent revolution. If you give them the opportunity, they will be violent against you. You will be hurt. It's not just a digital death. They will come out. I mean, one yeah. of our Supreme Court justices, there was an assassination attempt on him today. Yep. So it's like, so, so, so when I when I look at that, I go, okay, there's there's there has there there has to be a tipping point, to where where people are gonna go like, like that movie network. I'm I'm mad as hell and I'm not gonna take this anymore, yeah. you know. Like so so, I, I think that's where we have to go in order to have any hope of this changing at all. But I just want to hear your mm. your view of like, okay, what what needs to happen within. With I guess I guess Judeo Christian value affirming people worldview affirming people mm-hmm. what what needs to happen How, what's the response to all of this I think I'd say first of all I would I would agree with what you're saying um, when people come to me that you know are are not Christians that are are more concerned about things that I've said in regards to what's going to be happening with economics when I was telling people in you know the beginning of 2021. Uh, 
look out, hyperinflation's coming. You'd better start starting a garden <laughs> if you can, or you know, start limiting your transportation and live below your means. I was explaining this to people. People said that I was, you know, being too hyperbolic and trying to, it's like yeah. fear mongering, right? You know, the conspiracy. It's like, no, now they're getting it. I think that's one of the reasons that <clears throat> my podcasts have, have taken off now, but it's not the podcast necessarily I'm doing now. It's the ones that I did three years ago. <laughs> exactly. I'm saying, hey, this is what's going to happen. Right. So now, but yeah, I, I mean, I think live below your means, you know, try not to be a person that, that spends excessively. And that's good. That that discipline's good for your life. The second thing I think is that we have to hold our leaders accountable. Let's first talk about government. The way that you can really accomplish the most damage if you're wanting to do this is by using someone who pretends to be a conservative. Right. So when everybody's talking about the red wave that's going to be happening in 2022, I, I sure hope it's a red wave, but it's starting to look like a purple wave. Right. Because there was more damage done um in the years of, of George W. Bush, and I hate to say that for because mm-hmm. a lot of people loved him and so forth, than you can possibly imagine. Boris Johnson has destroyed the United Kingdom, mm-hmm. and he is a Tory, a conservative. But he's he's made Joe Biden look conservative in terms mm-hmm. of what he's done there in the last few years. In the church, here's the here's the issue. Because in the church, you have to look at the church in many ways, like almost like a tribal society. You know, we have our confessions, we have our community, we have the rules that bind us to community and those that talk about when you're removing somebody from the community and so forth, the community of faith. Um, But what we haven't really done is we have not applied those rules when it comes to our leaders. Somehow our leaders have been able to float through this over the past 12 years by either allowing this to happen or purposely strategically making it happen, or not even knowing what's going on and not listening to the warning signs. So you have institutions and leaders that have allowed this to happen, and now we're trying to say, oh, okay, yeah, nothing to see here, let's move along. Um, And so you actually have people that are getting more done in public schools with Moms for Liberty against critical race theory than you have that that are actually working within the Southern Baptist Convention, the PCA, trying to rid those institutions of this stuff because they won't remove the leadership. Hmm. So you have to both in your churches um, and then as well with the institutions that govern a lot of those churches, you have to start looking at, look, guys, hey, uh, you had your your twelve years, your ten years, your five years in your position. There's a there's a lot of jobs still out there for selling insurance. You know, mm-hmm. you could probably change some tires. Probably a lot of landscaping jobs, but in the church, it's not the place. Yeah. But what those people will do is they will try to use the Trotskyite uh, ways of using entryism mm-hmm. to basically push out those that are telling others that they must be eliminated. So you want to eliminate the guys that are calling for their heads, Mm -hmm. that are saying that we need a defenestration in some ways, Mm -hmm. that we need a new reformation and we need to reset the church. If anything, the church needs a great gospel reset, if you Mm -hmm. will, to bring back in the gospel, to bring back biblical principles and make sure that we're back on track again. And these people that have been career leaders that have taken us down this path need to do something else. Mm -hmm. So when you, uh, I have so many questions, but um, I really think that you've, you've you've given us a good framework to think about what's happening in our culture, mm-hmm. as well as what's been happening just it, specifically in the church. But I mean, even in our entertainment, I think you've yeah. given us a way to look at things and go, okay, I kind of have a better idea what's going on. Maybe people are going to need to listen to this two or three times to really get it. But I think you've really done that. And I think there, when you look out at this, let me, let me conclude by asking this question. When you look out there, is there anything that encourages you? Is there anything that, that makes you go like, okay, there, there, there is a light here. There is something I see God at work doing something. Is there something that gives you hope in the midst of all this? Yeah. Uh, that I'm talking to you about this Mm -hmm. right now. Um, because if you go back five years ago, no one would listen to me. And I mean, literally no one, there might've been a few guys that said, I'm starting to see it, but I can't believe it yet. When I tried to explain to them what's going to happen and how, these ideologies were going to come in and there was going to be a move to to bring us really to a social credit system. People did not believe me 
but I'm talking to you about it now. I'm talking to other people about it now. And what I see is that within the general population, a lot of people have said, you know what, you want to call me a conspiracy theorist all you want. No, I'm listening to things. No, I'm not listening to the far out stuff, but I'm just seeing exactly what's going on and calling a spade a spade. Yeah. And people are starting to wake up to this and understanding that someone is trying to do this to us. This is a Marxist move. It's really enviro fascism that's coming in. It's a blend. Mm. It's the worst of all possible ideas. But I see that people are waking up to it. I see them waking up to it in, in governance, in, in, corporate, in the corporate world, trying to push back on ESG, which is you know, the Antichrist himself. Mm -hmm. uh, and then as well within the church, I see so many good people that are going, okay, I see it now. And mm -hmm. what are we going to do about it? How can we clean? And But the tough part is, and we're talking about this, is the tough part is, is that we usually look at the Christian faith, at least in America, as, okay, this is something that, all right, now I have hope for the future. I know my destination. In some ways, it I hate to use this phrase, but it completes me. Well, that's not where we are right now. That's not mm -hmm. the epic of time we're in. We're in, you're basically in 1517 to 1524 right now. Mm -hmm. It's time for a reformation. And that means that it's going to, as Luther had penned in A Mighty Fortress is Our God, you know, this, you know, basically, you're going to have to let go of friends that are saying, Mike, don't cause trouble, or Jerry, don't cause trouble, whatever your name may be, and that we need to start moving towards, in doing it the right way, calling folks out and saying, but yet saying there's a standard by much we must live. That standard is the scripture. Um, we need to bring in godly pastors, listen to those godly pastors, and create another, another church model that is biblical and foundational, and I think that you're doing that well here in Arizona, that is concerned about educating its flock, that's not sending people away for years and years and years to go get educated, then turn out a pastor where you watch their lives, you mm -hmm. watch their doctrine, you, you're able to guide them in matters of the faith. I think something like that, more regional, I think, is going to be part mm -hmm. of the answer. So if people want to, if, yeah, if they want to dig deeper with you, they want to understand more of what you're doing, how do they find you online? Uh, Sovereignations.com. And um, then I do a lot with James Lindsay as well, and that's newdiscourses.com. And both of us have really enjoyed getting to know you over the years. Oh, praise the Lord. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So listen, we we, off, we also have a conference too that's coming up this week. I know that if someone's watching this after the second week of June, uh, I would really encourage you to um, find those recordings on YouTube and uh, watch them. If you've watched this and you've said, I really like this, I really wanna know more, I would start there. Watch the videos that are there, go to Sovereign Nation's website and uh, read the articles, watch the videos. This is the fight of our time. This is, yeah. this, this is it. And so every generation has its fights. You know it from your parents or your grandparents' generations. Well, this is ours. And right now it is an, it is a, an unbloody civil war going on in our country, but it's happening. And so the question is not just which side are you going to be on, but are you going to be in the fight? Are you just going to stand on the sidelines and cross your fingers and hope everything's going to work out? Because if there's mm. too many of you crossing your fingers and hoping it's going to work out, it's not. And so I hope this was helpful. Uh, thank you for joining us. We know it's a little longer, but this is so critical that you hear. So we'll see you next time for another edition of Redeeming Truth.